My name is Josh Buss, and I'm an assistant professor of chemistry. I'm here to talk to you about chemistry glassware and our phenomenal glass blower we have in the department, Roy Wentz, uh, who's been doing this for a very long time and was absolutely pivotal uh, working with me and my research team in designing and outfitting our laboratory space to do the type of work that we need to do. My lab features a a 10 foot high vacuum manifold um, that is specifically designed um, with I think a strong historical influence from the University of Michigan. I had a custom 12 foot fume hood made by a company called Mott out of Detroit and when that was installed we started taking measurements and you know I sat down with Roy and we built this manifold, uh, which again is multiple components, each main section is about 10 feet long. You know, we constructed it in little segments and we put those segments together and we'd make measurements. And it's, again, it's just a testament to his ability and his precision that I think of the hundreds of connections on this line, I think we missed on one. When I started my independent career here, I was very excited to sort of put my own twist on this type of equipment. This is a sketch that I put together. This is a mock-up that Roy helped me make. He you know, sat down and said, okay, well, what do you need to draw it out? And then he went through every part and he said, no, you don't want this. This is not gonna be strong. Can we do it this way? And so there was tremendous value for me. What I brought to that discussion was an understanding of how I wanted the line to operate. It was an understanding of what we needed to do the chemistry and what Roy I brought to that discussion with his, you know, decades of experience in this craft was an understanding of what would be long lasting in my lab, what would be durable, what would be a real investment in my group. One of the really fantastic aspects of this entire journey has been planning and sort of brainstorming this line with Roy. It was such an interactive experience where over the course of several months, you know, I would look at something, I'd say, eh, you know, I don't know what I'd really want. And he'd cut me four or five pieces of tubing and send me upstairs and be like, well, you figure it out. And when you got it, come back and we'll make it. And so it was productive exchange of both his understanding and knowledge of glassware and and again, what you know, my understanding of what we needed to do the type of chemistry that I want to do on this high vacuum manifold is something called a Tepler pump. Um, and a Tepler pump is really a large piston that uses elemental mercury to move non-condensable gases. Um, I've got a Tepler pump blank right here. Uh, so this is an example of one. And this is something that Roy made. Um, and it was really cool. He, he'd never made anything like this before. Um, but I think this speaks to his desire to sort of facilitate uh, research here at Michigan, he goes, you know, I've never made one before, but I'll try. We both think creatively about disconnections where we might be able to not have this be a fixed permanent piece. And he introduced me to a number of kind of different uh, options. So this is, this is an O-ring ball and socket joint. And this O-ring here actually improves that seal dramatically. It, it also makes the setup grease free which is nice. Um, and so you can get very good high vacuum seals. You still get a little flexibility. And now we have a point where we can take out the Tupler pump. You know, I, I really am crossing my fingers that we never have to. But if we did, uh, we would have an opportunity to take this out and we would be able to put it, uh, put in a new replacement or get the one that we have fixed. Um, another kind of cool part of this is this uh, ball valve here. Um, so that was something else that was in the original plan for these. Uh, that Roy had never made before. And so I've got sort of different iterations in my left hand here. This is a um, stock or blank of the exact same connection that's on the top of this pump. And you can see the electrode feed through here. You can see this is just left as an open tube, uh, but he's gone ahead and put in this uh, ground ball joint. 
And this is something where down in his shop, he takes a stainless steel ball bearing that I give him, and he physically grinds it to custom fit it to every single socket. And that's what makes the seal on the back side of this. This sits in a little pool of mercury. Um, and it's a certainly older design of a valve, right? It's not made of Teflon. It's, it's not really ground glass. It, it requires that, that little bead of elemental mercury to seal. Um, but it's a very uh, versatile valve in this application because when gas moves up the Tepler pump, it lifts this ball bearing and that allows for the passage of gas. And then when the mercury descends down the pump, um, that goes ahead and creates a, a, a vacuum tight seal. And so I, I don't know of a non-mercury analog that works that well, but it's it's a check valve of sorts that's designed that way. Um, something else that I'll, I'll sort of emphasize, because I told you I would as we go through it, you can see here this S-shaped support. Uh, so this is something that Roy added. This was not in the original plan. And that support actually goes through the side of the pump here, and there's a piece of solid glass rod that also holds this dip tube in place. And what's really fantastic about this is if you think about this setup, right, if I put stress on this valve here and this support's not here, this is now a very weak piece. And so Roy has gone through and he sort of thought about every uh, worst case scenario. He has such a familiarity having done this for as long as he has that he knows what students tend to break. He knows where glassware is generally the weakest. And so to help facilitate my work and I think to make his life easier, right? He, he goes ahead and he builds these in uh, so that I don't have to get this fixed and he doesn't have to fix it. And you know, this is absolutely like sturdy beyond belief. So again, and with this sort of this keen eye to longevity, to durability, towards function, Roy's able to, to really key in on critical little details that can save me a lot of hassle and him a lot of work down the line. And so I think that's really, really cool. Um, something else that's really cool about having Roy on site is he's able to fix things. And so this is actually something that I inherited from an organic colleague who ended up retiring. And it's something that I need to take down to Roy I believe these liquid liquid extractors, certainly one of this size, would run in the seven to eight hundred dollar range. So as a new professor setting up a lab, to be able to, to sort of inherit something like this for free and then take it to someone who can go ahead and fix a break like this, right? And so this makes this completely unusable um, with it in its current state. But to be able to have this fixed for sort of pennies on the dollar, that type of cost benefit is incredibly enabling to the science that I want to do because now I can spend my funds elsewhere and I can pay my students or I can buy chemicals or we can pay for instrumentation and measurements that we would otherwise be putting that money into, um, in my opinion, overpaying for glassware, uh, certainly because I've been spoiled and become sort of accustomed uh, to what is offered here. Custom glassware seems to be somewhat of a dime art and I think it's increasingly common nowadays that glass blowing scientific glass blowing is outsourced um, or really not done at all and so it really is uh, a, a shame that this is an art form um, that is no longer available for the support of fundamental chemistry research in academia and when I was on the job market in 2019 and 2020 um, I I had two offers, uh, one of course from Michigan and one from another school, and certainly a deciding factor was the glass blowing support offered here in Michigan. I can't emphasize how valuable that has been uh, for myself and for my lab. Um, you know, the goal here is not just to enable chemistry, but to enable us to do this chemistry safely. Um, and it's to be able to teach my students about these types of techniques, right? That's their job in graduate school. They're here to learn and I'm here to teach and so this type of experience where maybe the barrier uh, to letting them try it out 
is a lot lower because if they break it, the downside is we take it downstairs and get it fixed as opposed to they break it and the downside is it's several thousand dollars of grant money plus a two week turnaround at least. Plus we don't know if the piece that comes back is gonna be the same size and shape as what we need, right? I don't have to worry about any of that. I feel empowered as a mentor to give my students autonomy to use this equipment and it's very important um, for our research enterprise that we're able to not only have routine equipment fixed rapidly, uh, but really have customized equipment uh, that's constructed uh, specifically tailored for our uses. And, and I think the exciting chemistry that that enables us to do. He really does go above and beyond to try to make items that are going to, you know, outlast the students using them. At least I would say hopefully last me my entire career.